we met at one of those typically strange soirees one is obliged to attend the obligatory vapid chat over the obligatory plastic glass of rot gut chubbly following an award though do yourself for a judge, feigning delight in the recipient. But more often than not, the, the artist your committee is worried about is rarely anyone's first choice. So it's usually the least interesting, the least surprising or extreme, the one, you know, nobody can get particularly hot about in one direction or another. Well, I had recently a traumatic breakup. Had disintegrated in the most typical and mundane manner. It was on my fourth or fifth Chablis. Oh, God. Well, in any case, I was quite unhinged. And I had remembered how he was standing next to me as a composer who I had once actually been quite excited about. So we, we started to talk, and then I, I noticed him glance over to the door, realizing who I was, you know, the hated critic. And I felt this sense of this need to somehow bridge the the chasm, you know? There it is, the chasm. I remember I cramped his sleeves and my voice, I realized, was shaking. I was, I was weeping. I sort of, I sort of screamed in this high-pitched sort of wheeze. Why does anybody write a play about a critic who's a person? Well, I mean, we all have our judgments. We all have our opinions. We all say things, kind, damning things, because we all have standards, values. Uh, ideals. We actually believe in something. And just because I do it in public, I put it out there for everyone to see. I am treated like some kind of a leper. Or even believe it or not worse, like some kind of some kind of tyrant king who requires to be surrounded by sycophants who could never be seen as a person, fellow person. <laughs> that could just never be possible. Well, I might as well go sell shoes. Which is precisely what I told him. I said, you know, I might as well just go sell shoes. Because I think I'll do that. Why, why don't I just go sell shoes? <laughs> he looked at me like I was the insane person I was. And I realized there was nothing left to do but make good on my threat. So, you know, considering my chosen profession, one would have thought I could have come up with something a bit more damning, a bit more salacious. This is what I spewed in my drunken state. So I left, and he followed. Not, he later confided out of any sense of humanitarian concern, but rather out of a certain curiosity. Oh, shit. Well, it was it was it was damp and it was it was gray and it was midtown and, and I and I lurched and weaved my way uptown past the theater marquees and the Carnegie Hall and Columbus Circle and Lincoln Center and occasionally I would glance back to see he was still following me, wondering whether I should just stop and chew him out, just get into a cab and go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, wondering if it wasn't he who was the sick one, right? I mean, what did he want with me? And the next thing I know, I am standing in front of Harry's shoes. <laughs> I bolted in and sat down, my heart pounding. And he came in and sat next to me. We, we, we just sat there. Finally, the guy came over and asked us what we wanted. Al looked at me and he smiled very sweetly. And, and he asked me if I wanted anything. And I said, no, no, I, no. And so we left. <laughs> Went home together. We have been together ever since.